brilliant tinsel city of lights and fantasy. Hollywood, glorified, glittering, fascinating, fabulous mythical kingdom. Hollywood reaches far, carrying its cargo of dreams to almost every city and village in the world. To these people, to you, and to me, the movies bring magic. Yet, if seen the right way, they can also be a lens through which we view the world. And maybe, even a pathway to find God. So as I said a moment ago, we're wrapping up today a series that we've been doing this last several weeks, a blockbuster sermon series that we're calling Real Faith. We've been looking uh, at now five different movies, seeing where God shows up. And a few weeks ago, a young man, a TCU student, came to me and said, Mr. Russ, I understand that you are doing a sermon series on God and movies. And I said, it's true. And he says, I have the best joke for you that will fit well with any of your sermons. I said, let's hear it. I'm always in need of good material. He says, what do you call it when Batman skips church? I said, I don't know, Riley. What do you call it when Batman skips church? He says, Christian Bale. <laughs> so I wanted to tell that joke at the beginning of the sermon so that you know there's only one way for this sermon to go from here. <laughs> so this week we're looking at the very powerful movie, Just Mercy. It's an uh, incredible, powerful movie that is both touching and tragic, sometimes at the same time. It's based on a memoir, memoir, a book. Uh, the memoir is of Brian Stevenson, who is a lawyer and an activist who spent years fighting for the poor and the marginalized. And to help us to uh, see this film through the eyes of Scripture, we're going to look at two texts this morning. Uh, the first is from the prophet Micah who was called to speak a word of judgment to the people of Judah, they had been engaged in practices of injustice. They were essentially raising the rent on poor people, kicking them out, and then when the rich would move in, they would lower the rents. So it wasn't necessarily racial justice, it was an economic justice. And while all of this was going on, the rich and the powerful, well, they were still showing up and going to church. They were still singing praises to God, looking all spiritual and religious, but in their hearts, they were a mess. And so Micah had some hard words about how their worship was meaningless. And instead, that God wanted something more basic. The second text is from Ephesians, which is a letter to the church in Ephesus. Actually, scholars, scholars tend to believe that it was not necessarily a letter, but a homily, a sermon that was preached. It was attributed to the Apostle Paul, though scholars in the same way also questioned that it was him, suggesting that it was more likely actually written by a disciple of Paul. But according to the book of Acts, Paul did spend more time in Ephesus than any other place. And so he would have known this church. He would have known this community of faith more intimately than any other. And so for today, let's just take it at face value and assume that it was Paul who, according to tradition, wrote this letter while in prison in Rome. A prisoner in Christ, he says, early in the third chapter. Now, this letter, this homily, offers a, a pretty good summary of Paul's theology, his understanding of what it means to follow Jesus, to live a Christian life. And in this section, the author is acknowledging his own need for unmerited grace, while also pointing out that God can use people that find themselves in very bad circumstances they are still able to do really great things. And so I invite you to listen to this word now from Scripture. Good morning, University Christian Church. This morning's first Scripture reading comes from the book of Micah, chapter 6, verse 8. Here begins the reading. He has told you, O mortal, what is good? And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God? 
The second reading is taken from the New Testament book of Ephesians, chapter 3, verses 7 through 10. Of this gospel, I have become a servant according to the gift of God's grace that was given to me by the working of his power. Although I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to me to bring to the Gentiles the news of the boundless riches of Christ and to make everyone see what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things, so that through the church the wisdom of God in its rich variety may now, might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. Here ends the reading. The word of God for the people of God. Thank you, Eric. Eric always reads scripture on this weekend every year in celebration of his birthday. So happy birthday, Eric. He's going to tell us his age. Are you ready for this? You're not telling. 52 years old. Congratulations. You don't look a day over 51, my friend. So of all the movies that we have looked at over the course of this series, of all the ones that we've talked about, this movie, I would suggest, is probably the most overtly theological. In fact, you could even say that the strong faith of Brian Stevenson is one of the most important narratives that runs throughout the film. It comes through loud and clear. The issues of justice and mercy and grace, these are at the forefront of the story. You can't miss them. Now, one of the first things that we learn about Stevenson is that he was raised, he was formed in the context of the church, that he grew up singing in the choir, playing piano at his AME church, and that he does the work that he does in part because he was taught in the life of a church to follow God and to serve God. And we quickly see that this faith is both a a source as well as a a motivation for his justice-seeking work. I watched an interview with him this last week, and he talks about how his faith informs his work. He says, faith must always lead to action. Now, Stevenson is an African-American Harvard Law School graduate who probably could have gotten a job with any firm, any high-powered, prestigious law firm in the United States, any firm that he wanted, he probably could have named his salary. But while he was in law school, he spent a summer doing an internship that brought him face-to-face with the grim realities of those that sit on death row. And he met prisoners that were his own age, that grew up in a neighborhood similar to his. And he quickly came to realize He quickly came to realize that we have a prison problem in our country. He learned that we have the highest incarceration rate in the world, that we make up 4% of the world's population, but yet we house 22% of the world's prisoners. Right now, there are 2.3 million people in our nation that are currently in prison, and another 7 million on probation and parole. He came to discover that there are massive imbalances along racial lines, that the likelihood of going to prison if you were a white male between the ages of 18 and 30 is 1 in 17, but if you were a young black male between those same ages, the likelihood is 1 in 3, and that in urban areas across this country, places like Los Angeles and Philadelphia and Baltimore and Washington, right now 50 to 60 percent of all men of color between the ages of 18 and 30 are either in jail, on probation, or on parole. He also came to discover that these numbers are skewed not necessarily just along racial lines, but are also distorted by poverty. He came to see that we have a system of justice in this country that treats you much better if you are rich and guilty than if you are poor and innocent. In Brian's words, wealth, not culpability, shape outcomes. So rather than taking this high-paying position at a prestigious law firm, he heads to Alabama 
where he applied for and received a federal grant. And so he opens, he opens the Equal Justice Initiative, which according to its website, is committed to ending mass incarceration and excessive punishment in the United States, to challenging racial and economic injustice, and to protecting basic human rights for the most vulnerable people in American society. Now, both the book and the movie, they detail the story of a gentleman by the name of Walter McMillan, a man accused of killing an 18-year-old white woman at a dry cleaner in rural Alabama. It becomes clear quickly that McMillan is as innocent as he claims to be, that there's no way that he either could have or would have committed this crime. But yet, in spite of a lack of physical evidence, a witness statements that are uh, from questionable witnesses, one who later recounts, the prosecutor forged ahead, and the judge sent an innocent man to death row. Now, unlike the movie, the book covers Brian's story a little bit more, and how it is in many ways parallel to Macmillan's, but yet it talks about why he feels compelled, called even, to do this work, the hard, holy, patient, courageous, faithful work of doing justice and loving kindness and walking humbly. There's a scene early on in the film when Stevenson, fairly fresh out of law school, is ready to leave his life up north in Delaware. He was born and raised for his new life down in Alabama. And he's talking with his mother, who, as you can imagine, is deeply worried that her son may be getting himself into something that is a little bit more dangerous than he's aware this young black man heading into the deep south to start a career fighting the legal establishment at every level for its crimes against the poor in general and people of color in particular. Now it becomes quite clear quite quickly that his mom is as proud as she is worried. And you get the impression though that she would have stopped him if she could. She says, what you are doing is going to make a lot of people upset. And if you can't see the danger in what you're doing, then you need to ask Harvard for your money back. <laughs> but he explains that he just wants to help people and reminds her that she is the one that taught him from an early age to fight, to work for the people who need it the most. Have you ever noticed that sometimes doing the right thing calls us to do the hard thing. That following Jesus, fighting for justice, it isn't always easy or safe or sensible, especially if you are doing it right. And almost never does it make you popular, especially amongst the people in power. Though, as Steve Jobs once says, if you want to make everybody happy, don't be a leader, don't push back Sell ice cream, because everybody loves ice cream. Well, his mom was right about the danger of his work, and multiple times he received death threats and bomb threats. He faced harassment from local police. And in the book, he tells the story about the night that he almost quit, the night that one of his clients was executed despite all of his efforts and he writes this, he says, after working now for 25 years in this area, I understood, I understood that I don't do this because it's required or necessary or important. I don't do it because I don't have a choice, I do. But I do it, he says, because I'm broken too. His years of struggling against inequality, abuse of power, poverty, oppression, and justice had finally revealed something to himself, and that is that he was broken too. And the truth is, church, that we are all broken. We are all broken by something. Maybe you've hurt someone, maybe someone has hurt you, but we all share in that brokenness in some way. And so in quoting Thomas Merton, he says, we are bodies of broken bones. And he goes on to say, I guess I'd always known but never fully considered that being broken is what makes us human. 
that we all have our reasons and sometimes we are broken by the choices that we make and sometimes we are shattered, the things, shattered by the things that we never would have chosen. But our brokenness is also the source of our common humanity, the basis of our shared search for comfort, for meaning, for healing. Our shared vulnerability and imperfection, it nurtures and sustains our capacity for compassion. You see, we're all broken. But being broken is what makes us human. But there is a a blessing in that brokenness. There is a strength in that brokenness. In embracing that brokenness, it creates a need, a desire, a passion for mercy. There's another moment in the movie when Stevenson is trying to convince one of his clients one of his clients who's on death row for a crime that wasn't his, trying to tell him why he does the work that he does and that he's not just another one of the unqualified, incapable, uncommitted attorneys that had turned his back on this person like so many others. Stephen says that he won't quit. He won't give up. He won't leave them like the others had because he knows knows what it's like to live in the shadows. Friends, there are so many, so many people, too many people living their lives in the valleys and the shadows of death. And the truth is that we have been there ourselves. Or maybe we're there now, and if not, chances are that at some point in our life we will be there. We will know what it's like to live in the shadows. And it may not be prison, it may not be death row but we might know the shadow of sickness or sadness that seems unsurmountable. We might know the darkness of of addiction or divorce or a fear that we just can't shake. We may one day sit in the various and sundry shadows of loneliness or despair, depression, anxiety, joblessness, victimhood, failure, abuse, guilt, shame, and so on down a, a long list that we don't have time to name this morning. But whatever the case, there is right now someone in your life, someone in your midst, maybe someone sitting near you, maybe someone that you see when you look in the mirror that could use a little light, that could use a little grace, that could use a little forgiveness, a little mercy, could use maybe just a little bit of hope for a change. Brian often speaks of protecting our hope because he says hopelessness is the enemy of justice. Protecting our hope means, means never losing hope that love is more powerful than hatred, that, that life is more powerful than death, that mercy is more powerful than condemnation. As Brian says, we are all more than the very worst things that we have ever done. And isn't that what Paul is essentially saying to the church in Ephesus? That even though he is the least of the saints, that grace has been given to him, not because he deserved it, not because he earned it, not because of anything that he'd ever done, but simply who he was, a child of God. A God who created all things. You see, that's the thing about grace. It meets us right where we are. Grace meets us right where you are and it says to you that you are more than the worst thing that you've ever done. At the end of the film, Stevenson is testifying before Congress about the Macmillan case. Now, a little bit of a spoiler alert. Macmillan is eventually set free when the charges are dropped. And he says this. I came out of law school with the grand ideas of how to change the world. But Mr. McMillan made me realize that we can't change the world with only ideas in our heads. We need convictions in our hearts. He taught me how to stay hopeful because I know now that hopelessness is the enemy of justice, that hope allows us to move forward even when the truth is distorted by the people in power. It allows us to stand up when they tell us to sit down. It allows us to speak up when they tell us to be quiet. 
I've learned, he said, that the opposite of poverty isn't wealth. The opposite of poverty is justice. I've learned that the character of our nation isn't reflected on how we treat the rich and the privileged, but how we treat the poor, the disfavored, and the condemned. He goes on to say that that if we look closely at ourselves, closely and honestly, I believe that we will see that we all need justice, that we all need mercy, and perhaps we all need some measure of unmerited grace. You see, church, it doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter what's been done to you. You are not the worst thing that you've ever done. And because of that, we are invited to partner with God, to do the the hard, holy, patient, courageous work of faith, to follow Jesus doing justice and loving kindness and walking humbly, bringing light and sharing grace, extending mercy, offering love and hope and second chances, all in the name of Christ himself. All of us, all of us, need justice. All of us need mercy. All of us need some measure of unmerited grace. Amen.
There's another incredibly powerful moment in the film. It comes just after a scene in which Stevenson finds himself at wit's end. He's grown incredibly frustrated with the work that he's been called to do. He experiences once again a roadblock, a stumble, a, an injustice. And he finds himself sitting beside the Mississippi River, complaining, frustrated that people are even unwilling to have hard conversations about things like injustice and racism. The scene changes, and he finds himself in church. Now, in this scene, there's no dialogue at all, just music that plays underneath, but yet you can see on his face the struggle, the struggle that he was feeling, the tension, the weariness, the anxiety. But over the course of the scene, as they worship together, there is this sense you can see in his face, see in his face that he is once again committed to the work that God has called him to do. You see, I think in many ways that's the reason that we come week after week, not just to this church, not just to this table, but to be reminded of who we are, of what God calls us to do. And we are we are strengthened for the fight. We are given the tools that are necessary in order to live out the faith that God has entrusted to us. And so we keep coming back week after week to taste and believe in the goodness of God that calls us to transform the world by living out Christ's courageous love. And so we come to this table and remember the night that Jesus was with his disciples. And he took bread and he blessed it and he broke it and he said, this is my body, which is for you. Take and eat of it, all of you. And as you do so, remember me. And then in the same way, after supper, he filled a cup and he said, this cup is a new covenant that I pour out in my blood. And each time you drink from this cup that you eat from this bread, do so remembering me. And so it is that we come to this table to be strengthened, to be renewed, to be reminded of who we are and what God calls us to be. Let us pray. Creator God, as we gather around this table to share this bread and this cup, we are reminded of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Let us never forget that all are welcome around this table and in this community of faith. Let us never forget that it is never too late to experience your grace. Let us never forget that it is never too late to experience your mercy. Let us never forget that it is never too late for your love. And let us never forget that it is never too late to serve you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.